And then in 1 Peter 3 verse 9, we're told, just before we're told that God with God is a thousand years is like one day. But now we're told the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. What promise? The promise of the Lord Jesus Christ coming and the earth winding up. As he says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So this really fulfills what we've been saying already this morning in the sense that when, we, when God speaks to us through the prophets or through what's happening in our circumstances in our lives, we have to listen. And when we listen, it leads to repentance before God. When, when God speaks to us about something that's not right in our lives, it's repentance. It's real repentance that is required. Not just, oh yeah, well I won't do that. And then forgetting about it. You know, God calls us to repentance. We really have to repent. And we're told that, that God is long-suffering. So, you know, sometimes we have difficulties and God, God is patient. A day is like a thousand years to God. God's not interested in how long things take to sort out. He is interested in the damage that's caused in the meanwhile. And we have to take that into consideration because when we do things wrong, we have responsibility in that. And although he forgives us for what we've done wrong, it doesn't affect the collateral damage that that causes. And we have to take stock of that. And people could actually have difficulty with us because of the things that we do wrong. And the law could have difficulty with things we do wrong if we break the law. So there are repercussions. Even though God forgives us, even though we can be forgiven by someone else or forgive ourselves, there is still sometimes the repercussions and the outworkings of what we've done wrong in our lives. And we have to own that and accept that and live with it. And that's the, that's the truth of it. But it says that God is long-suffering. God is not like people. God doesn't give up on us. God is long-suffering. If he believes and knows, which only he will know, what's in your heart and what you really believe and feel towards God and your fellow man, he is long-suffering and he will bring you to repentance and faith. He will cause you to get right with him eventually or at some point. Now, obviously, it helps us if we do it quicker than, than later because it can actually alter our lives completely. And the feeling of knowing, of just knowing that you know that you're right with God, it's a joy to behold and something happens. It's like being suddenly immersed in, in, in warm love that, that just kind of, it's almost overwhelming sometimes to know how much God loves you and to know being right with God, there's peace in your heart because you haven't really got peace in your heart outside that. You might have peace in lots of areas, but if there's an area of your life that you haven't dealt with and isn't right with God, when you deal with it, it's, it's wonderful. It's an amazing transformation in your heart. And God is not willing that any should perish. He doesn't want you to die. He doesn't want you to go to hell. He doesn't want you to have a, a terrible life. He wants you to live a good life for him. As Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He wants us to have a good life and to live for Christ, live for him. But it says in verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with great noise. So, we have this picture of God being long-suffering. But the fact is, he's got a time. <laughs> and we don't know when that time is. Now, although God is long-suffering, he's still set a time. Even, the, even Jesus didn't know the time. Only the Father knows when he's going to wind up this earth. That's a real wonder, isn't it? But that's a fact. So, although God has been long-suffering with you so, so far, up to now he's been long-suffering with, with you, but you could lose your life tomorrow... Tonight, today, we could have a major catastrophe and all be wiped out. Where will you be going? Where will your soul be going? Your bodies will be destroyed, but where will your soul be going? Where will you be? So we don't know the day or the hour, and nobody else does, and all these prophecies load of rubbish about when it's going to be, because we're told very categorically we don't know. So when we go with that, when we go with that, and we see this in verse 10, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. 
We have to be watchful. We have to be ready. And we're coming into the New Testament now to find out. So it's all in God's timing, not ours. And we have, we have information and accelerated technology and learning that helps us to kind of know what's happening in the world. And we're really beginning to get to a point of almost saturation with knowledge and understanding. But we still can't control anything much that God's in control of. Because God is the one who's in control of it. And everything is in God's time. And we're not in control of time. We cannot control when this thing happens. Because it's going to come as a thief in the night. And even Christians don't know when God is going to do this. So we have to be very careful. And it says, In which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. It's not a pleasant picture. You need to make sure you are one of the people that are actually in the rapture, that you are actually plucked out of this place before that all happens. You need to make sure your heart is right, because if your heart's not right and God comes back, Jesus comes back, like the bridegroom we're going to hear about now, it's too late if you're not ready. And so we come into the New Testament now, finally. This is in uh, Matthew's Gospel, and it's chapter 23, sorry, uh, 25, I believe, verse 1 to 13. Matthew 25, verse 1 to 13. And it says, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. We have ten, ten virgins. A picture of the church, ten virgins. Nice round number. Now five of them were wise, and the other five were foolish. Hmm. Those who were foolish, they took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered and said, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore. For you neither know the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So there it is again. We don't know when Jesus is returning. We have to be ready. You have to be watchful. Do not sleep and slumber in your sins. Do not sleep and slumber in not listening to what God is telling you for your life. If God has got a plan and purpose for your life, you need to be listening to what God's plan and purpose is. And stop following your own agenda. It's about what God wants for you, not what you want for you. Because what, what you want for you will lead to destruction. What God wants for you will lead to the path of life and his plan. And you will be happier. The minute you start getting out of his plan and purpose, things start going wrong. Same happened in my life. Just be very wary. Be very careful that even though you may be a Christian, even though you may be doing God's work, you need to make sure you stay close to God in all areas of your life, not just some of them. And true Christians, we know we're under the blood. We've been renewed by the Holy Spirit. We've been baptised and we really have hearts that want to serve God if we are truly Christian. But you see, we see something here very clearly, don't we? Very clearly. And what I've been saying this morning is, is borne out yet again, that there were ten virgins. This represents the church. There were ten virgins. Five of them were foolish. Five of them were wise. The five that were wise were ready. That's what it's about. It's about readiness. It's about being wise 
by God's standards, not by the world's standards, and being ready for him coming. Being ready for him coming is making sure that your garment is, you are clean before him. You are ready. If you're getting ready to be married, what do you do? You prepare yourself. My goodness, how much people spend on preparation for marriages and weddings is amazing. Most of it's gone out in all the pomp and splendor now, just for the status of it, so it's such a big event. But the preparation of the bride is really, really important to her and important to everybody else in that she presents herself as pure. The white dress, it signifies purity. It signifies that this person has kept themselves specifically for that person. It signifies that the person is clean. They've had a good wash. They may have been had all sorts of oils and all sorts of things. But they're ready. They're prepared. They've been working up to this. This is something that's been going on for some time. They want to marry the bridegroom and they're ready and they want it. And everything hinges on marrying the bridegroom. Everything points towards and focuses towards that bridegroom. Everything. It's not about them anymore. Suddenly it's about us. Suddenly it's about the other person. And that's what happens. And this mixed bag that's in the church today, there are some who are going to be wise and there are some who are going to be foolish. Make sure you are one of the wise that knows how to make sure that you have what's necessary to be taken by the bridegroom. Because if you're in the wrong place and you have all manner of muck all over you, in your white dress, and you look a state, and you, you're sin, you're dirty, don't be surprised if the bridegroom says, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, yeah. this isn't the one I chose you're not you're not you're not one of the ones that I am looking at and so the visible church has this mixed bag and regardless of all our week, all our works for the Lord many are still dead in their hearts and sleeping and when Jesus Christ returns if you're dead in your heart and you're sleeping then you will not be received. Churches are still full of divisions today. <clears throat> There's so many wranglings, aren't there? Over silly issues sometimes, many secondary issues. We're taken up with whether, you know, whether we accept gay people. We're taken up with whether women are accepted in, in, in forms of leadership. We're taken up with so many secondary things that are not relevant to what we're doing. And I know that they are two very, very highly um, important things to a lot of people in this world. And I'm not going to say anything about that because it's not about that today, really. It's about what our attitude is towards Christ, what our attitude is towards God. And so repentance and faith and grace and holiness are the, sometimes they're the elusive qualities in the church that Christ wants. Some have got issues, soul issues, that attach uh, and are really cancerous. And so we need to be, to be working right. We need to get the roadblocks out of the way. Some of us are helpless and weak and unable to act righteously. We need to give them help. But for some, repentance just won't come. And the Lord will return. And guess what? It's too late. Make sure you're not too late today. Make sure.